What did you eat for breakfast? <laughs> I had uh, what did I have today? I had a egg sandwich. <laughs> Welcome to Music on Your Own Terms, the podcast that aims to help musicians develop an entrepreneurial mindset through interviews, as well as discussing resources, concepts, successes, and more. Providing a platform to talk about negative emotions such as anxiety and depression in order to help overcome them in the context of music and reduce the social stigma. This is episode 148. This episode is sponsored by Ignite Your Music Career. You may remember in episode 90, I chatted to Craig Dodge about sync licensing and how he makes a living through writing music for TV, video games, and film. Musicians all over the world subscribe to Ignite Your Music Career and earn more royalties, more upfront sync fees, and more recurring revenue from their music. Whether you're a composer, singer-songwriter, band, beatmaker, or instrumentalist, your music can be earning you more money. Internationally acclaimed composer, musician, and music educator Craig Dodge has licensed his music in more than 1,000 TV show episodes, films, video games, and ads all over the world, and he will show you how you can too. Ignite gives you the information you need in a simple, accessible format, and you learn at your own pace. For just $6 a month, you get a video lesson each week on topics related to music licensing, from writing techniques to how to find your markets, and everything in between. You also get tools and activities to build the skills you need to be successful, and each lesson includes a royalty-free sound pack to download and use in your own music. The key to success in the music business today is to diversify your sources of revenue. Ignite will show you how. For more information or to subscribe to Ignite, visit the website at taris-studios.com or click the link on musiconyourownterms.com. Rob Balducci is a guitarist I've been listening to since the early 2000s, participating on his website forum, and downloading his Lick of the Week MP3s when they came out. Rob joins me in this episode to talk about how he began his professional musical journey, working at Relativity Records when Joe Satriani's Surfing with the Alien was released, and how Joe gave him pointers on the demos that became his first album, Balance. We also hear about the gear companies that inspired him early on, many of whom he has had long-standing endorsements with, including Ibanez, Damasio, and Didario. Rob graciously takes us through the track listing of his upcoming album Transcendence, due to be released early next year, that has been inspired by the death of his parents, and how he channeled that experience into his music. If you enjoy the podcast and want to show your support, I'd be really grateful if you would consider signing up for the mailing list to stay in the loop with everything going on with the show. Just head over to musiconyourownterms.com and click the link. While you're there, you can also visit the store and grab some merch, or just buy me a coffee and help out with the running costs of the show. Thanks for listening. Okay, welcome to another episode. Uh, today, I'm hanging out with Mr. Rob Balducci. How are you doing, sir? Good, thanks. Thanks so much. Thanks for uh, having me on. Oh, you're very welcome. So, yeah, I've, I mean, I've been into to your stuff probably for about 20 years. I definitely, uh, I think I bought the, the Balance album from Guitar 9, which is no longer with us, unfortunately, but... I know, it was great. Yeah. So let's dive in. I want to start off by going back to your days at Relativity and Surfing with the Alien comes across your desk. Yeah. What was that like? I mean, that, I, I I talked about it recently. I, I did there was I think it was the anniversary, and I did a post on one of the social medias. At that, that time for for guitar, especially at that label, was was like just amazing. I mean, there, had, mm. there was so much good music coming out of out of Relativity, with surfing, and then of course they also had Flexible that was going through there. Mm -hmm. So I mean, just to be in there at the at that like hot spot was 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 amazing. That's that's awesome. How did you get the job, and what did you do when when you were there? Well, I what what happened was I um I was going to college. I graduated a music college. It was called Five Towns College, mm -hmm. and uh, I wanted to get you know I figured let me get something in the music industry just so I could learn stuff, meet people, and that kind of thing. So it was kind of like local to to where I live, 
and I had a friend working there. At that, at that time, it was called Important Records, you know, and it was Relativity. Mm -hmm. So I went in there, my friend introduced me to them, and they gave me a job, and I, you know, I started out in the warehouse, you know, picking orders and stuff, and that's really where you get to see, like, everything that's released. Mm. So, I mean, they had any, everything from, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the uh, hardcore stuff that was coming out, and Combat Records was through there, plus mm -hmm. they had Relativity. So it was, it was an experience to see all that type of music, and, and, and I think it's a good, it was a good experience because of, you know, it was an independent label, so the the mindset of that label at the time was, you know, wasn't so based on the fact that they wanted to make well, let's release this band because they we're gonna make a lot of money like it is now. You know, let's mm. let's get the one hit thing going. It was more like a development thing, and they saw a band that they thought maybe could write some good songs or had a good energy, you know, an independent label, and they would then they would pick you up, and it was like a development thing. So, I mean. Just experience that was was really good. So I started there, and then I moved into like the mail mail center, which was dealing with a lot of the promotional product, mm -hmm. promotional mailings, and I kind of like I kind of like stayed in 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 that in that area while I was there. But it was it was a good place to be because it was the hub. Mm. You got to meet a lot of a lot of like the the record stores at the time, all the tower of reps, and uh, yep. you know also the artists because I was. I was the one that was, I ended up being the manager, so I was dealing with a lot of the artists, getting the, the promotional product stuff. So that's really how I met, that's how I met, I met Satriani that way, I met Steve Vai that way, I met Steve Lukather, I met, uh, uh, who was the guy from, um, God, how can I never, Steve Howe from, yes, mm -hmm. I mean, the, the amount of people that, that I met, and they were all like, all those guys released records through that label. It was like, it was mm. amazing. <laughs> that's, that's killer. When when did you start playing guitar in the first place, and and what got you into that? Well, I started I started early. I would say probably around ten years ten years old. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I I was introduced to it a little bit earlier than that through uh, my I had an old my older sister. I have three older sisters, so my oldest sister Barbara she played acoustic guitar. So I remember at a younger age than than ten, you know, picking it up and stuff. Mm. But I, I didn't start like getting, getting really into it until around ten years old. And you know, part, to be honest with you, part of it was at the same age. I, I I'm, a, I'm a type one, di so I have juvenile diabetes. I came down with diabetes at at uh, around ten, eleven. Mm -hmm. So getting that and like the, you know, at a young age, you know, it's scary when you find that you have something. So the guitar ended up being like like the escape. You know, mm -hmm. and I really kind of like, I just kind of, I, I was a shy kid to begin with, and that kind of made me go introverted even more. So it was really something that to, 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 to escape what was going on and I spent, you know, that, that was really all I was, I would think about was the guitar. <laughs> mm. Right. I mean, Balance was your first release. Reese, yeah. Yeah. But did you have anything prior to that, that. I know. I, I remember you saying something about you know talking to to Joe and him giving you pointers and stuff. Was that at Relativity? or Was that after that? Yeah, that was. That oh, that was, was what, at real. Yeah, yeah that's that was right. when I was at Relativity. Yeah, and uh, that was like some of the demos of the Balance record that I had sent them. Okay, <laughs> that's awesome. Um, what was Joe and uh, were Joe and Steve kind of your influences for staying with I or going with Ibanez and then consequently staying for so long? Or was that something prior? Yeah, it was something pri prior. I mean, um, I ended up, I ended up playing like I had a, I think a seven seventy before that, and that was like kind of kind of like my first Ibanez, and you know, at that time, mm -hmm. you know, the first thing you do is you you get the pickup. So I I, I had a fascinating, you know, from you got to realize from ten years on, I totally like when I was immersed myself in the the guitar stuff. So I remember like I, I don't know back in the back in that time. You know, there wasn't like the internet and stuff. So I remember mm. you I, you would write a letter. So I remember writing this letter to Demarzio Pickups, asking them for the for for them to send me my catalog. And then you would get like the, the big the catalog in the mail. And so I started to do that with Ibanez. I did it with Demarzio. I did it with all the companies because it was so cool. You would get these cool color catalogs with the artists in there. I, I remember as a kid seeing that, and it was I was like fascinated with it. Mm. So that kind of like introduced me to to the, those equipment companies. 
and I ended up getting an Ibanez used from somebody and then I had a buddy of mine kind of like, you know, fix it up for me, I had different pickups in it. So that was sort of my introduction to the I to Ibanez. And then, of course, you know, when, when I hit Relativity, you see those people using it, but you see the ads in the guitar magazines, you know, the, mm. the Paul Gilbert ads and, you know, yep. all those. that's really was what got me into it. But, you know, to, to, you know, and I, this is still to this day, you know, you get, I got into the Ibanez guitar really because I really like the way they play, you know what I mean? I mm. like the way they sound. So, you know, years later when I was able to get like the endorser with them, you know, that, that's like, you know, that's like a dream come true. You know, you, you know, mm -hmm. when something like that happens and I tell people, you know, like I, I'm like fortunate enough and lucky enough to have these these companies support me it's really you know having the endorsement is icing is this icing on the cake you know like i would be using those guitars whether the endorsement were there or not and that's sort of how like i judge you know especially in the industry today where there's uh, to, to me that there's so many people that like you see them jumping around using different guitars mm -hmm. i mean i really wouldn't ask somebody for trying to get an endorsement with somebody unless i really like the stuff for sure, and that's why I, you know, I'm loyal. I stay. I'm, I'm with, you know, Ibanez is that was is 30 years this year. Demarzio is really first, so it's probably like 32 for them. And Diodario was 1990. I'm still with them. You know, I'm still with Morley. Mm -hmm. So I kind of stick with the companies because I like, you know, that's what I like. I mean, Diodario, you know, just think, you know. 12, 13 year olds, right? Yeah, and you, you get these catalogs, the Diario, the Demarzio, and the Ibanez, and the, you know, and then later on, you're able to get into a working relationship with them. It's, it's, you know, it's like sort of like fantasy land. <laughs> yeah, that's killer. I do want to touch a little bit on what you're playing now because you, you've had your, your gorgeous looking uh, lax for a while. You yeah. Know, all, all the different colors and, and they're really striking. But now you've been using the a, AZs. Yeah. You know, I haven't actually been able to pick one up yet. You know, obviously quarantine and stuff. You know, the obviously the the uh, roasted maple. I mean, it's awesome. What are they What are they doing differently that the uh, you know your super strat style guitars are not doing, or is it just 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 a different just different flavor for the moment? Yeah, I mean, to me, you know, you I I just think that uh, this was my first attempt at you know uh, playing the the, the roasted mm -hmm. and and really a non locking. I have one non locking LAC. But, uh, you know, using a non-locking system, which I ended up finding out, not that I don't like locking systems, but there, there is a, a, a feel difference mm -hmm. with something without a locking nut. So I do like that side of it. I do like the neck shape, which is different than, my, than the regular stock Wizard and S's. Uh, my LAC sort of had a, they were more similar to what Ibanez is called, like an ultra neck. So they really weren't completely flat. So the so the AZ is like kind of right up my alley, mm. uh, closer to my LAC necks than anything else. And the roasted thing, I you know I never tried it. You know I heard about it for a while. And when I got these, the, the coolest thing about them is, is that, I mean, I got them. I got them when they the prestigious when they kind of were first out, maybe a year into when they were released. Got it set up by the guy that usually does my setups, uh, this guy Sal Tyne, who's I, the only guy I bring my guitars to. He set that thing up. I haven't gone back. I mean, I flew, you know, you f I flew different weather. The neck does not move, mm. which is which is amazing. That's the one thing that's amazing about it. So for for an artist that's playing around a lot, you don't have to worry about the uh, your neck being adjusted by weather or tr traveling, which is to me is awesome. Is that a one piece? I don't, I think it's, I think it's, I don't, I don't know. Okay. I don't want to say, cause I didn't look into the detail. I think, it, I don't know if it's one piece. It might be, I don't, I don't want to quote it. Cause I'm not sure. Right. <laughs> I've, I mean, I've got an RG that's, I think seven piece, mm -hmm. got, you know, got things, Babinga and then a couple of strips of Babinga, maybe a purple heart and, and walnut or something. It's, and it's got a maple fretboard. I had a gem. But I was cramping up a lot because the neck was so thin right. as I got older, and I I switched it. I found this RG used. To, it's one of the fade out models, newer, and uh, yeah, just the neck is so comfortable because it's thicker. Yeah, that's it. I I know what you're saying too. Like for playing a long time, you, you end up getting a pain in your thumb and stuff. Mm. That's another thing why I, the 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 AZ neck I, I I really enjoy, 
And the, you know, the new a new thing to me was the was the stainless. It's the first guitar I've ever played that had stainless steel frets on it. Mm. And I do I do like them. It's not that I don't like the other. There's just some. It's uh, there's a little bit something different about it. It, fe it feels a little bit. The, I, 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 it's hard to describe, but like the bending seems to me seems a little little smoother. Mm -hmm. And there's a little like you know there's kind of like a sparkle on the top end that you don't get, yep. which could be, which is beneficial in some points and sometimes it may not be, you know, mm. but I, totally. it, yeah, it's, it's, it, I, I'm digging them. I really, I really do like them. I, I use those. I've been using them le recently live and, uh, the record was, a was a mixture between the, the AZs and the, and the LACs. Cool. One last gear question real quick. Is that XP 100 still alive? Every time I see a picture, it seems to have more tape on it and, uh, which one's the XP 100? The old, the old whammy. The... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I still have it. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Does it still work? It, you know, here, here's, I have the, that original whammy and you know what happened to it? It, it, it did die on me. Oh. And I, I, you know, I got in touch with Digitech and they said that, uh, they, you know, I, I, they, they quoted me. They said, listen, you could send it back. They said, but. We've tried to do this with like they they mentioned Kirk Hammett and, and some other people, mm -hmm. and that soon as they open it up to try and get to their thing, that it like kind of because they're so old and whatever they used, it kind of deteriorated. Right. That's why they're not making th those anymore. But the wha I, now I've been using the uh, the whammy. I guess it's the whammy five. Okay. That came out, and I I do like it. So that's really what I, I've been using now. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, I wondered if it had died because it I was. Know. It was, uh, that's an old unit. So that's yeah. great. So yeah, well, let's talk about the, the new record. So it's, what's the release date? I'm hoping, I'm hoping it's going to be in November, maybe towards the end of November. Really what's holding me up is, uh, you know, really, you know, we've been in this pandemic and everyone, you know, everyone's worrying, should they release something? Should they release it? And I was holding it back for a while for that reason. And then really the 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 main reason was i couldn't get it's it got pretty bad in new york so and i and i'm mm -hmm. pretty like you know i'm watching and and being health conscious so i really didn't want to get into a room and take photos with somebody so just recently i it started to feel a little bit more comfortable so we ended up taking uh some photo sessions for it and now mm -hmm. uh, i'm just waiting to get those back from the photographer we're going to get pick what, what we're going to use the uh the guy's going to do the art and uh, I got to update my website a little bit, and then we'll be able to re to release it. I'm releasing it myself. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping I can, you know, I can get it cranking soon. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. So tell us about it. I mean, the title, and you know, writing process. Yeah. Well, you know, this is this is real. You know, not all my stuff. You know, for people that know me, know that the 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 my music is is very personal. Mm -hmm. It's about life experience, you know, and I kind of like, I don't release records, you know, every year, you know what I mean? And part of the reason why I, I do that is, I'm not tooting my own, horn, my own horn here, but I feel that my catalog is really good because when you put on balance and then you move on to mm -hmm. mantra and then you move on to color light and then you got vile horizon, there's a spread of time between them and the... The, the, you know, they don't sound the same. They sound mm. different. Song, my songwriting changes. And really the, the, the main thing about it is, you know, you're living your life. And the thing is, if that's how I write records. That's how I write my music. So you got to experience different stuff. Mm -hmm. And if you don't experience stuff, what, you know, to me, there's, that's the, how are you going to be motivated to write, <laughs> write anything? For sure. So this record in particular, you know, I, I chose the title Trans Transcendence for the record. And... You know, basically, if you look up the meaning, it's like existence or experience, like beyond, you know, the normal or f physical level mm -hmm. uh, or, uh, you know, uh, s surpassing, you know, your uh, your boundaries, you know. And the reason why I did that was uh, the last couple of years and the the whole total writing of this record is, has was been when my both of my parents ended up getting sick. Mm -hmm. I ended up kind of taking a lot of time off. To, to be with them and take care of them. So that's really what the, the inspiration behind the record is. And the same thing for the, you know, I, I'm not really religious, so, you know, it, it encompasses what, whatever your belief is that I, I still, still believe that, like, after this life is over, that your, 
you're you're moving on to something else and whatever religion you're in it's fine you know i everyone i think that all religions are really all kind of the, the same and that you're moving on to some place and whatever your belief is it's supposed to be better than here mm -hmm. so that's where the title of the transcending comes in you're kind of like transcending into a different realm so that's the idea and then you know when you go into the tracks i mean each of the tracks like uh the, the, the title the first track is called ring of god and uh that's uh the the inspiration behind that is uh you know basically uh my, my father was sick he uh he ended up giving me i you know i, I really haven't taken them off he, there's a ring with his initials on it and it's his mm -hmm. wedding band and you know i'm not saying my father was god it's just like in, it's it's thinking back to you know everyone when you're a kid if you if you're lucky enough to you know to to have a dad and know them you know you always think your dad's like the superhero right you always think he's like the the you know the best person mm. uh so that's how sort of where that title evolved and i thought it was a cool title and that's what that song uh inspired inspiration behind that song comes from the second track is called tomorrow never comes and you know that that kind of really comes with just being surrounding with people that are in there and you know they're going through that that their end times mm -hmm. that uh, it makes you really think you know uh what happens if you wake up tomorrow and and you're not here right right so it's it, you know it's pretty it's a pretty deep record and you know it's not like the record is depressing or anything I, to me it's sort of I th it's upbeat i think but uh, that song in particular is one of my favorites i think i uh, uh i had a friend of mine christy craig she did some electric violin on it real to me it's really uh you have a good feeling when you listen to it and uh, you know on the record well, on the record i have that i'm talking about it but i, I want to make sure i bring up my band i have kenji tajima who's my drummer it's been with me for a while andrew goble they did such wonderful work on it mm. i had a the, the my engineer and producer steve simonson he he did some keyboard tracks on it for me and then i have a cousin joe stone who did keyboards on a song called bliss and that was the band and i did the, all the guitar parts and like if you if we go through the track listing, the third track on the record is called Twelve Twenty Four. That's is actually my mom's birthday, mm -hmm. so that's where that title comes from. The fourth track is called The Presence, and that that's you know a lot of people think that you know, maybe the presence is like you know presence of a spirit or something, but that's not really. What I mean, it's really it really has to do with if you ever heard the term I had the presence of mind, mm -hmm. uh, you know and you know, when you're dealing with having to, you know, situations where, where you have to make decisions for somebody else's medical stuff, you know, you got to be, you have to have the presence of mind to be thinking the, in the right way for them mm. and not only think about yourself. So making right. choices that maybe, maybe not the best comfortable choice for, your, for yourself, but you got to make it for the individual. Mm -hmm. So that's where that title comes from. And that title actually has... Uh, I took some recordings like that my mom left voicemails for me. So like her voice is in the beginning of that. Mm, okay. Uh, and some of the songs you kind of hear a voice at the end of things. So it's, it's kind of interesting to have her on there. <laughs> That's awesome. Then we, then we have Bliss, which was, that was the first song that I, that I uh, wrote for the record. And that was, that was the, that was like right after, it was kind of like right after my father passed, you know, when you kind of like, you know, you kind of retreat a little bit and I really didn't play for a while. Mm. And then I picked up a guitar and I started to, started to with, with playing the chords to that. And, you know, basically bliss meaning, you know, you know, kind of like your, your state of mind, you know, after going through such like a depressing thing, maybe like seeing a little bit uh, of a positive mm -hmm. uh, thoughts, you know what I mean? So I, I, I chose that, you know, I, I kind of really, uh, choose the titles i'll go and i'll think of a title then i'll go to like to the th of the source and i'll see if what that what it means my, the title that i thought and then if there's another word that i think sounds nicer so that's sort of how i kind of pick certain songs mm. then after uh the F bliss the sixth track is called the in between mm -hmm. and that really you know that really uh, kind of i like i I'm not religious, but I was brought up in, in uh, like I went to Catholic grammar school, I went to Catholic high school. So the in-between, you know, in, in, the, in, that re in the Christian re religion, there's the, uh, 
you know, maybe like when you pass, supposedly there's like a purgatory kind of mm -hmm. thing. So, the, so it's that's what kind of like the vibe of that one is. It's it's a it's a more aggressive, heavy tune, and it's sort of like what you would go through if you're in that realm between the between the two places. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's a pretty cool track. Seven is called Beautiful Lullaby. That and that's that's another one one of my my favorite tunes on the record. That was like probably the second song that I wrote on the record. And it was it was cut, the record was done in two studios. Most of the record was done here. The earlier stuff was done in in a in another one which I called was Blue Buddha, and this is called Blue Buddha 2.0. <laughs> so that one was recorded there, and uh, it's a, you know it's a it's a really to me it's a really nice tune. I have nice tones on it. There's some cool little whammy stuff going on in it. There's a lot of texture cleans going on, and the inspiration for it. You know, I, I don't want to get anyone too depressed, but basically I've never been around like a family member. So when my father died, that, that passed. So like I had no idea like what what happens, you know. So he he passed away and you're in the hospital. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm sure everyone, everyone goes through this, uh, you know. And, uh, you know, we kind of sat. I was the, me and my sister were the first ones, you know, we, we were going to see him and we got the call that he passed. So we get to the hospital. And you know, you go into this room and, and you know you you sit there and you you know your father your loved one whoever it is is dead you know what I mean so I was like it was weird and then like we had to call all my like I have four sisters we had to call my other sisters you know their daughters we had to get my mom there so like we're sitting in there and, and you know with the, my dead father you know and I it was just kind of I I can't explain it you know I've never mm -hmm. been through it before so I started to think about stuff and that's kind of where this where the title came from you know lullaby meaning like he's he's asleep you know forever beautiful because you know it's it's your father you know and i i really kind of thought like what what would be happening or so it's almost like when i when i listen to the song now i kind of think about like if you did die you know maybe you're you're like floating he's floating above the in that room you know, and mm. looking down on everyone else that's that's sitting there. So that's kind of it's it's pretty deep, but that's that's what I think about what, when I uh, when I hear that song. Awesome. And then uh, you know, dying breath. You know, it's, it kind of is what it is. I I mean, if when someone dies, that you know you're gasping for for breath. Mm. And uh, it's an interesting tune. I, it's it's very melodic. It it's supposed to depict you know like the the process of when you when you die um and you know it starts out with a with a sample of some like some weird breathing type of thing going on and it's got some really cool effects i, I and i used a lot of uh the h the even tide h9 mm -hmm. so like specifically went in there and found like found that weird guitar kind of thing where it sounds muffled when it starts and yep. then there's sort of like an envelope filter on some of the melody that's coming from there I really use that effect a lot in the record. It's on um, like the presence. You hear like a you hear like a kind of like a keyboard pad in the back. That's the H9. Mm -hmm. It's a really interesting pedal. You can get re re you know you got to delve into it, but you can get creative with the sounds, and it sort of like inspires you. You know what I mean? Because there's so much sure. cool stuff in there. Right. So that that was uh, that was used in there. The last one is Eternal, which is track ten, and that that also has I think my mom's voice at the very end. And really, it's really what eternal means that, you know, the people that pass on, they're going to be with you forever. Mm. So that, that's sort of like the inspiration. And, I, you know, I, I think when, when uh, part of my, my process is when you, when you write something that's personal to you, I think it comes across to, to people that listen to it because everyone kind of has these experiences. And, some, mm. you know, I still have people that write me about off balance. There's a song on there called Waiting for the Sun, and it was about my brother-in-law that passed away, you know, mm -hmm. and people didn't know that. And I get people writing me saying, I, I don't know what is about this song, but when I hear it, I, you know, I, you know, kind of, I kind of makes me cry. And, you know, it's, it's, I think that that tran it transfers when you oh, spend sure. time writing stuff that means stuff to, to, to the artist. When the artist writes stuff, you know, it's not like getting in the room and saying, hey, we got to, we got to write this hit song or we're going to write a song in seven, eight, you know, it's, it's. Mm -hmm. Totally different vibe. <laughs> for sure. Yeah, was, thank you so much for sharing that. It, to me, the, the, the album sounds, I, would, I don't want to say deeper per se, but it definitely feels like there's a lot more emotion in it. 
just on on you know obviously I've only listened to it a few times in the last couple of days, but it it definitely seems like there's less like shredding mm -hmm. in you know maybe for the heavier tracks there's still you know your normal stuff but it it, it feels more melodic and more emotive it, you know and obviously you know this conversation illustrates why it is do you feel that you know it, obviously you were inspired by the the events that transpired but did this album really help you heal yeah, I mean, I I I think so. I I think it did. Um, it's a release, you know, that it helps you get mm. through stuff, and you know, just just working. You know, again, it started when I was a kid. You know, you you usually go towards, you know, when you, when you start at a young age, going towards the instrument to kind of escape stuff. Mm. You know, that kind of stays with me. So you always have, you know, I always have the guitar there to uh, to try and like, you know, I, I wouldn't say. I would, like I, I like I, I like I said I'm not real like I'm talking a lot in this interview but I'm really like not a talkative you know I'm really an introvert so the guitar makes kind of right you you could get that energy and put it into into writing music in the guitar mm. and you know the other cool the other the cool thing about this record it's really just kind of like a development of of through through all my recording processes and playing that like this record really you know. Each record is like that, but this record in, in particular, like like for instance, um, Bliss. Bliss was, you know, I, I came up with the chords, I went and I demoed it. The, on that song in particular, I'm using the, the atomic amplifier pedal for the rhythms and for the lead break and, uh, and the melody. And it's like, that, that was the demo. It was one take on the, on the melody. Mm. And my, my feeling now is it's always been that way but this record i really like wasn't i stood by my my instinct like i'm gonna go in there's no way that you're gonna play something the same way twice it's just never sure. gonna happen and no matter right. if you practice it 500 times it's not gonna be the same it's not gonna record to the tape the same way so in the moment when i was doing it i went back to it and i was like and a lot of times it's a lot of the stuff is improvised like i have to go back and relearn this whole record so the thing is what was i going to do go back relearn what i did to try and play it better cuz maybe there was a little something wrong mm -hmm. i was like i'm not i'm not i'm leaving it and i and i left it and that kind of kind of stuck you know throughout the record you know what i mean i i went with the basic my, my initially what i usually do is i demo the the songs and I do it to a click, and then we go as a band, and they play to it, and then I take all the stuff back, and then I'll redo the rhythms. On this record, most of the the rhythm tracks are like really were my original scratch tracks. I left it because some of the stuff, like especially on like Beautiful Lullaby, it was done in another studio. One track was the amplifier pedal on the cleans on one side, the other side was I think the Cornford amp on the clean channel. And like, it was really me, like, I played down the one track and then I went and I kind of started to think about inversions. And I was like, ah, oh, you know, that sounds cool. Then I, I tape and then I'll get the part down. Then I'll go to the next part. Or what I gonna, and I hit the tape. So what am I going to do? Go back and, and go, go back and I have to relearn that stuff to re-record it? I said, you know what? It sounds fine. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And you got to, you know, if you listen back to, you know, now music can get so like, with recording and, and everyone having this stuff in their house, like the, the, the people that go in and, and you got to move the hit because maybe the, the bass and the drums weren't exactly on. And so every, everything is like bam, 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 bam. You know what I mean? When you listen back to like, I don't know, my favorite bands, you listen to Led Zeppelin, you listen to The Who, you listen to all these, these great like bands. They're not perfect all the time either. Right. I mean, so to go back and make everything pristine and... So that 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 kind of like stuck with it, and I was like, you know what, I'm gonna keep it, uh, you know, and and that's mm. what I did. <laughs> yeah, I mean, today today with the, uh, you know, everyone's home home recording setup is basically better than anything they had in the 70s, 80s, 90s because the technology is right there in this laptop. So yeah, you know, there, there's no there's no real reason that a demo is now, you know, a crappy sounding tape demo. Then now it's it's releasable. <laughs> so but yeah i mean i i totally feel that i mean you, a lot of times i think stuff is sounding way too clinical at this point it's yeah. it's too too on the nose and it's like it just doesn't have a human feel to it anymore yeah 
So let's move on to the non quick fire question round. All right. I think I'm going to skip this one <laughs> because it basically the question is what significant negative experience have you overcome? But I think with, you know, what we've already talked about, we've kind of covered that. Yeah. Uh, but what major positive experience has given you the push to follow, you know, music as a journey? Positive experience? I would think, you know, just like I, I brought up, you know, that person writing me about my the, that one song. I mean, I, I think it's, you know, I, I uh, th th it's kind of weird that ju you're judging your success. To me, success is not, you know, I'm a platinum selling artist because let's face it, I'm mm. not. I'm not a gold selling artist. I'm an independent artist that writes instrumental music. I didn't do this to, to, to get girls and I didn't do this to, if I was going to make money, I would have, you know, I, I wouldn't be doing this. <laughs> so I think the, the positive experience about it is, is being able to, you know, express myself do and, and do this type of stuff and have the ability to do it and get, you know, and the people that do listen to it, like it, and you get a positive experience from people, mm. you know, t people telling me, hey, listen, I, I like this song, you know, uh, it made me feel this way. And you know, or going to see some, you know, playing live shows and having people come up to you and say, hey, Rob, you know, I, I have your your mantra record and that one song, I'm glad you played it tonight. I love, you know, stuff like that. I mean, that that's the positive stuff that, that makes it worthwhile. I think it makes it makes you move on. But in the same sense, I do like to say that, you know, the I, I think that creating music should be for yourself, mm -hmm. you know, first. Because, I mean, I always say this, some people don't agree with it, but like I write, I like my own music, and if and if I didn't like it, how can I expect you or our listener to 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 enjoy the stuff? You have right. to like what you're doing. Sure. So I think that's a big part of of the creative process. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, actually, let me precursor this question. Do you do you actually make money from music? Is that your livelihood? I uh, I make money from music, but I also do I I teach guitar. Mm -hmm. I do some session stuff. So it's it's a it's a mixture. You know, I it's funny. I read a. There was a uh, Amazon thing, or no, not Amazon, but it was. I saw it on Amazon. There's a new Frank Zappa documentary that came out. I don't know if you saw it. Not yet. And uh, the, it goes through like interviews with him, and he and he basically says, "Listen, if you're a," and this was back then when he started. He's mm -hmm. like, if, "Now it's even more because of the way the music industry is." But he's like, "If you're going to be an original artist and write original music, you better make sure you have some other form of income." <laughs> <laughs> which I think is 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 true. I mean, it's it's a hard business. Absolutely. So you gotta try to kind of seek stuff to help you. But you're but you're you're making your your living is music in general, like not yeah. just releasing. It's teaching and session and everything right. else. Awesome. So, what is one piece of advice you would give a musician looking to make a living from music? I would say you got you you get you got to be in it. You got to enjoy what you're doing. It's weird. It's like a two-sided question. You gotta, you gotta enjoy it, and which I think goes with anything that you're doing for for your for life. But uh, you have to have fun. Can't take yourself too serious. But in the same sense, it is a business, and you have to treat it as a business because you know there's a lot there's a lot of people that you know it's 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 like a really tough. It's tough. So. You really better like it because there's some sacrifices along the way. <laughs> right. Yeah. Awesome. Final question is what does music mean to you? What does music mean to me? I mean, I think music is like it's it's what's running through my veins. I mean, I mean, I, you know, I don't think I can, I, you know, I, I could see myself doing other stuff, but there's always going to be music, whether and that's not my own music. I mean, it's listening to music. I mean, I think. People look back at their life, soundtrack to your life is is really songs. When you think about your childhood, right? You're thinking about mm -hmm. what band you were listening to at that time. So I think it, I think it's, you know, it's music is just as important as the air that you're breathing. <laughs> awesome. Uh, maybe one more question related to gear. What's a, a new favorite pedal? You mentioned the H9, but is there anything else that you've gotten in the mail that opened up recently that's that's like blown you away a bit? Yeah, the the newest. Here, let me let me see if I can get this. Hold on, I recently got this pedal. Uh, it's another tube screamer pedal. Okay, Femoram. All right. So this, I'm I'm into I'm into overdrive boxes, <laughs> and this pedal is 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 really it's awesome. I mean, it's got mm -hmm. it's very musical. 
I like it on clean tone as well as boosting, you know, amp tones. I also like the way it sounds on, uh, you know, some pedals and some digital things don't work well together. Right. It does sound good through my amplifier pedal. I also have a DV Mark modeling. Uh, uh, it's called the multi amp that I use. So this sounds really good in front of that. So this is one mm. of my, my favorite pedals. To bring up uh, one more pedal that I used a lot on the record is the, is the Keeley, it's called the Keeley Monterey pedal. Okay. Which, which is real, is a vibe thing. That's that, and it also has like an auto wah. So when you hear Tomorrow Never Comes, the melody has that, you think it's a wah, but it's like an auto wah with some other like effect that the, the pedal has on it. It's just a beautiful pedal. Mm. Plugged right into that thing. And, you know, that's another, that's another song that like I used the pedal, I got the pedal, I plugged it in, and I said, wow, that sounds good. I said, I heard the melody, I started playing, I kept it. I didn't, didn't redo it. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. Awesome. All right, so for people that want to find out more about your music, get in touch with you, where can they go? Okay, so you can go to robbelducci.com. And I will be redoing that. You know, it hasn't been updated for a while, but there's still a store there. There's still information on there. But for the new record, every it's going to be updated. And you could also, of course, everyone's on social media. So please, you could, my band's on Facebook. It's the Rob Alducci Band. Instagram is at Rob Alducci. Twitter is at Rob Alducci. And also YouTube is at, you know, Rob Alducci. Awesome. So you could check me out on those and that all those sites. That's great. Any any re plans to return to the uh, the lick of the week with the the really like game show intro? I think I probably find a, a hard drive where I downloaded a bunch of those. Yeah, I mean, I want to, You know, I, a lot of people have been asking me about it. You know, I, I kind of, you know, there's so much stuff out there now, right? You know, mm. every guitar player. You know, look, even Steve Vai is on like a Patreon site right now. I mean, so I want to start to do something like like more like a like I was doing like a weekly thing and I think what I'm going to do is I'm uh because of the new records coming out and because of the situation that uh, all of us are in plus musicians are in and it's the gigging thing is a weird thing I'm I'm going to really try and up my game on like a live streaming thing mm. so I think I'm going to try and do like maybe like a uh when the records comes out I'll do a a live streaming of me playing some of the stuff that maybe like pick pick songs from the color light and do a live stream with that. And, and then I'll put those over to YouTube after they live stream. And uh, maybe even going into like the studios now because of what's going on where I can go actually with my live band and then stream it. Right. So that those kind of things I think I want to do and start getting back into posting the stuff on, on uh, getting it back up on YouTube because I kind of been silent for a little bit. Just recently I started to post a little bit more, but I, I have to get mm -hmm. back to it. Awesome. And then finally, at the end, I like to play a piece of music. I mean, do you have a do you, do you have a favorite track that you've heard of the heavier tracks? I think I I really just just on those few listens, I like the in between. Right. But yeah, I mean, if there's something that you want to put out as a single, or if there's something that means more in terms of what the track is, totally up to you. I mean, how about how about like uh, how about Ring of God, which sure. is the title track. title track. Okay. Uh, intro track, I mean, yeah. Intro track, yeah, absolutely. So we'll, we'll hear that one. Cool. Fantastic. Well, this has been a fantastic conversation. I really appreciate you taking the time and sharing, you know, all about the album. So, yeah, continued success and keep in touch. Yes, that, listen, I really do appreciate you reaching out to me and, uh, and having me on. It's a, it's a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening. I'd really appreciate it if you would leave a review on iTunes or your favorite podcast platform as this really helps get the word out about the podcast so other musicians can benefit from the awesome knowledge that my guests are sharing. The more the musicians' community collectively learns, the stronger we will become. A rising tide lifts all ships. This episode is sponsored by the Skinny Armadillo Printing Company in Fort Worth, Texas, offering a full range of apparel decoration and promotional items, such as screen printing, embroidery, laser engraving, and much more. The Skinny Armadillo is now offering a merch fulfillment service, including on-demand printing and a custom-built web store, so you can concentrate on your music and running your business as a musician. Visit theskinnyarmadillo.com or call 817-546-1430 to learn how the Skinny Armadillo can help you take your merch to the next level. Keep pushing the needle and be excellent to each other. This is Rob Balducci, 
with Ring of God. (laughs) 